Well, it's the 10th day of our exclusive series, New China. This special series celebrates the 70th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. Today, we'll show you how people in one rather isolated village in China's southwest overcame difficulties to develop the local economy. We'll also talk to people from different walks of life to see just how their dedication and hard work have changed their very own lives. Well, our teams are on the ground and in our mobile studios. They're all ready and standing by. Let's first get to CGTN's Sean Caleb's in Taoyuan. This dynamic duel is in Chongqing Municipality's Wuxi County. So, Sean Taoyuan, good afternoon to you over there. Tell us more about this county and what's so special about it. Hey, Michael, dynamic, dynamic for sure. Now, during our trip through the southwest of China, we've talked extensively about the country's economic miracle. It's a growing network of highways and railway system. The rise of the smart industry in the country, as well as old industrial cities, transforming into a more sustainable economy. But there's another storyline in China going on, really, one that's much more gloomier, poverty. Now, behind the impressive numbers, the sobering numbers, 30 million people still live behind, below the government's poverty line of uh, less than one U.S. dollars a day, most living in the countryside. Many live in adobe homes carved into mountainsides, and some still without access to running water or modern toilets. Now, the country is under a self-imposed deadline to lift everyone out of poverty by next year. It seems like it's on track of reaching that goal, which speaks to the government's resolution as well as a uh, resilience and hardworking spirit of the impoverished population, but the clock is ticking down. As you can see, we are in the great outdoors. We are in one of the more impoverished villages in the southwest uh, portion of China uh, that we are tucked away deep inside the mountains. It is hard to imagine that just a few hours drive from here, there's a modern metropolis, Chongqing. It is a place in which seems a world away from where we are now. Like many poor villages in China, Gao Dong Sun is empty at its core. Young people are moving on elsewhere for work and money, and they leave behind the elderly and the children who scrape a living off of the land. But the breathtaking scenery, many people here are struggling to make ends meet. The county of Wuxi in Chongqing Located offers in visitors county, Asia's Wuxi, version the Lion Grand of an American Canyon landmark is bordering Hubei province. In the, mega city. the canyon stretches more than 60 kilometers long with a maximum depth of some 2,500 meters. And the narrowest point is only about 13 meters wide, making it one of the most spectacular sites in the entire country. A 1.2-kilometer-long road that traverses the steep cliffs is another attraction here. Constructed by the local villagers over a more than four-year period, the project was considered mission impossible. The road connects a small village beside the canyon with the outside world and has helped the locals improve their livelihoods. Over the past few years, the canyon has attracted a growing number of visitors, especially during the late autumn when the leaves on the mountains turn red. The local government's next step is to further improve infrastructure and related facilities to boost tourism here, which is expected to grow into a major source of income for local villagers. Well, the Chinese county of Wuxi, which is uh, where we are at right now, is where you'll find picturesque beauty, like China's version of Grand Canyon. But behind the scenery, many people in different villages are still trying to get out of poverty. One small village here got to work in a seemingly impossible way. CGTN's Yang Jinghao shows the unwaver unwavering spirit of how if you build it, they will come. 69-year-old Yang Zhihan and his fellow villagers are working against time to construct a series of tourist facilities, including a sightseeing platform, parking lot, and a public toilet to meet the upcoming autumn peak season. Tourism, in fact, they could not have imagined years ago, before they constructed a road with their bare hands. For generations, people in this small village of Wuxi County were isolated from the outside world by massive mountains. 
Before the road was built, if we wanted to sell our farm produce in the city, we had to work for two days carrying it on back. Our shoulders would have abrasions. In the summer, the towels we brought along would be soaked with sweat. Then we were determined to build a road to spare our kids from such suffering. Digging out a road on sheer cliffs was considered mission impossible. And but for the villagers, they just decided to risk it all. A total of fourteen people, no elderly or children, started the arduous journey in August two thousand one, treating the construction site as a battleground. We knew how dangerous it was, and our lives would be threatened. But to us, even if we died during the construction, it was still worth it. The challenges were diverse and steep. Farming was no longer their priority. They didn't care about what could be gotten for food, as long as they were not starving. Without expertise or professional equipment, each step was just like treading on thin ice, such as when using explosives. Once I lit thirteen sets of explosives, then I hurried to climb up along the rope that tied me as fast as I could. They began to explode before I reached a safer shelter, and I could only hide my head in a cave on the cliff, leaving my butt unprotected. After more than four years of hard work, the 1.2-kilometer-long road was finally finished, stunning all outsiders, including local officials. Looking back. Yang still feels excited and proud, yet bitterness still lingers. Back then, we still faced financial difficulties, so we worked during the day and tried to borrow money from relatives and friends after work. If it didn't work, then we had to turn to banks for loans. For many people, the road is a miracle, but for Yang and his fellow villagers, it is the combination of belief. Unity and hope. Yang Jinghao, CGTN, Wuxi County, in Chongqing. What an unforgiving yet beautiful environment out here, where we are now. The farming is actually carved into the mountainside, the typical sort of terracing way that China has done it for so many generations. But that is nothing compared to carving out that road in the side of the mountain. Just unbelievable. Now, our reporter Yang Jinghao will join us live from the road.、Uh, Jinghao, you have been there at least twice. So tell us your impressions and how you think this road has really changed, opened up the village. Hi Xiang, hi Taoyuan. I'm just on this very road beside the、uh, steep, steep cliffs. I think I believe you just can't imagine how it feels to walk on it. Yes,、uh, especially for people、uh, afraid of heights like me, it's scary but also exciting. And today I just invite Mr. Yang Zhihan to our show. Yeah,、uh, I, as I just introduced him、uh, in, in my story, he's one of the builders of this unbelievable project. Today he will share with us more behind this、uh, project. Welcome, Mr. Yang.、Uh, so you just told me earlier that it usually took you almost two days to visit the downtown of your county. So how did you manage to do that since there were no roads at all? 就您之前就是跟我说你们去一趟县城需要两天时间。那么当时你们是怎么做的？我们以前没有修工的时候，以前去县城的时间。大约要十三个小时，啊，十三个小时才走到。就是从那个，从家里面出发，下下河，再爬坡，爬坡，爬坡要爬五个小时，再下县城，起码要四要要四要三四个小时。爬爬那个坡。要爬那个坡，要四五个小时才爬上去。Okay. Mr. Yang just told me that first they had to trudge down these steep cliffs. All the way to the bottom of the canyon, and then climbed over the massive mountains, as we can see from here. And this is just halfway of the whole journey, and there were no any、uh, shortcuts. And they sometimes they had to catch、uh, self-made torches to light the way. So, how has this road changed your lives? Changed. Your village. 那么过去几年，就这条路给你们家、给你们家乡、给你们呃的生活带来哪些变化？这条路，哎，给我们的生活带来了，经中这个
，发展你们的经济不能变，变不成钱，收入变不成钱啊！对我们老百姓呢，都有多大的刺激？现在我们的公路修通了，对我们老百姓，我们的发展的经济，我们哈是能能能,能变成钱哈。啊可以能够自己可以弄些个卖，还还还有住房，住房方面呢，我们家家户户住上新房子，改上的，改加改成农家乐，还还引进旅客们、同志们到我们这个地方来来玩耍，好，住好吃好，环境卫生要搞好，也要感谢，也要感谢党委和政府，我们这里我们的乡党委王书记，王伟娟同志，还有杨乡长啊，我们做了很多工作，帮助。Mr. Yan just mentioned several aspects. First is their livelihood. In the past, he said they just grew some simple uh, crops like corns and potatoes to support their basic living. But today, they can uh, cultivate some uh, cash crops like tobacco and Chinese medical herbs, uh, which can be easily transported out of the village. And this is just an important uh, source of their income. And the second aspect he mentioned is their uh, living conditions. Uh, they used to live in the adobe houses, very shabby houses, but today they have all moved into the concrete buildings with good decorations. And because for, on one hand, they, they have more disposable incomes and also they can easily get the construction uh, materials uh, thanks to the, the, the road, right? And he also mentioned a very important aspect. Uh, thanks to the, the improved infrastructure, today more and more visitors are coming to this village, this beautiful village, to enjoy the beautiful scenery, the natural beauty, enjoy the natural beauty, and also uh, experience this very special road. So they, they now also operate homestay, and which is also growing into an important uh, source of income for them. And he believes that as the China's poverty alleviation uh, campaign deepens, they will benefit a lot more from local government. Yeah, that's, thank you so much, Mr. Yang. Thank you. Okay, Xiang and Taoyuan, this is what I have from this special road. CGTN's Yang Jinghao, thank you. Um, we can now bring in our guest, um, Party Secretary of Wuxi County, Mr. Tang Dexiang. So, sir, thank you so much for joining us. Talk about um, development. I think there's a saying in China, if you want to get rich, built roads first, right? We can see the mountains and canyons, and these things are really the reason why this place is uh, less developed. So tell me, what is the local government doing in terms of uh, improving the infrastructure in this region? Wuxi is located in the backland of the three quarters away from large and medium-sized cities, so traffic has always been a bottleneck restricting development of Wuxi. In recent years, the situation has been keeping improving. At recent, the road network with the county as the center, the national, provincial and the county highways as the skeleton and the rural roads as the tip is taking shape, the total mileage is over 7,000 kilometers. Next, Wuxi will focus on one railway, four highways and one airport, which will fundamentally break the bottleneck restriction on the traffic and provide important support for deeper opening the border area among Chongqing, Shanxi and Hubei. First, accelerate the construction of Zhengzhou Wanzhou high-speed railway, Wuxi branch, strive to start the, a track connection project by the end of this year and start construction of the whole branch in year 2021, and second, to accelerate the construction of highway network, although right now we only have Fengjie Wuxi highway available to the traffic, but the Wuzhen Expressway connecting Xi'an is under construction and is packed to open to traffic in year 2022. The project connecting the neighboring counties, such as Wuxi, Yunyang, Kaizhou, Wushan, Wuxi, and Wuxi, Chengkou Expressway have all seen smooth progress. So very soon we will see a networking with five highways connecting Sichuan, Hubei, Shanxi, and other provincials. Arriving in the city cluster of Chengdu, Chongqing, Xi'an, and Yichang within three hours, something feasible. Third is to speed up the construction of a general airport in Wuxi. Right now, everything is operates in a worldly order and hope to start construction before the year and 2021. I'd like to offer our thanks again for you taking time to chat with us. And one of the wonderful things about our new China adventure, I've got to see just amazing scenery, meet some wonderful people. I've done both here uh, where we are. But this is 
obviously one of the poorer counties, uh, poorer counties in China. Uh, tell me about the hardworking spirit, how that is helping lift people out of poverty, and how are they turning this hardship into their advantage? Mm-hmm. We talk about the good ecological resources are the biggest advantage of what we see in the future. We will stay committed to the strategy of vitalizing and opening the county through tourism based on ecological resources, learn and use well the theory of two mountains and promote ecological conservation and green industry development, and vigorously promote ecology first and green development in order to make this place a beautiful area with thriving industries and wealthy people. First, we do a better job to optimize ecological environment, strictly hold the right line of ecological protection, the bottom line of environmental quality and the safety, not overuse natural resources and fight tough battle against the pollution and manage the mountains, rivers, forests, lakes and grasses and make sure this with lucid waters and large mountains. Second, to strengthen the ecological industry and will continue to take tourism as the strategic pillar industry and make sure everything can develop in a green way and will also bring the agriculture with mountain features and also make the modern serious industries and also we look at the big push to the tourism economy and third to bring more effort to urban and rural countries and move forward with a people center respect for nature and also we hope to see be a build a green home, improve the green system, foster green culture, and endeavor to make this place a demonstration area in the three gorgeous reds of our region. Party Secretary of Wuxi County. Well, I think if there is a drawback in our new China experience, it's we can't stay in one place a little bit longer so we could see the mist around us is uh, it reveals itself every now and then mm. and we just see these rugged mountains green plush forest mm. it has just been a wonderful little mm. nook and cranny to kind of get in to see how uh, the really impoverished areas in china are mm. being lifted out but right now our colleague nin hong is at hunan province uh, behind him the eventful canal in the story nin hong talking about the spirit of china what did you find in the red flag canal mm. Hmm. Well, I had heard uh, the story of Red Flag Canal, but this was the first time uh, I came here. I'm really impressed by their remarkable deeds, but what surprised me is that there are more visitors than I expected. There are party members from across China all coming here to see the canal and hear the story of the people of Linzhou. I had the opportunity to meet one of the builders of the canal. Uh, he is the youngest, uh, Zhang Maijiang, now is in his 70s, he told me some stories about the canal. It all started with a simple choice made in 1960, building a 70-kilometer canal to solve the drought that plagued the people of Linzhou for centuries. The project was spearheaded by a new 27-year-old party secretary, and the plan was to build it in 100 days, if only it were that simple. We had a saying then, a hundred days of hard work for the water from the Zhang River. We will rearrange the rivers and mountains. However, a dozen days after we started, some people still thought the bottom of the canal was the top. Another heavy blow was the death of the canal's designer. Wu Zutai died in a tunnel collapse at the age of 27, only a month into the project. The Red Flag now started from revolutionary romanticism. In the 1950s, the whole country was shrouded in an exciting, passionate idealism, and people thought that they could make any achievement. But when they went up the hill, they realized it's not like that. People only had a simple toast in their hands. A famine was unfolding across the country. Many people that worked on the site were starving. Yet people still decided to carry on. Zhang Maijiang was the youngest worker then. He joined the workforce at 13, replacing his father, who died in an accident. My mother sent me to the canal herself. People in Lingzhou believed the canal was for the people. Zhang spent the next eight years working among the Taihang Mountains. The most difficult part of building this canal is to cover it on the cliffs of Taihang Mountain, and this is it. People used to work, eat, and sleep here for years. 
nearly 100,000 people work here for nearly 10 years to finish this project. 81 people give their lives to the canal, the youngest only 17 years old. The project was finally finished in 1969, about 10 years after it began. The water helped to increase food production in Lingzhou tenfold. Still today, it is a scenic spot where groups of party members seek the spirit of party predecessors. The spirit of the red flag now is seeking truth from facts and having the courage to think and act. We now have advanced technology, better lives and a powerful nation. If people today could still have the passion and spirit of that age, what China would be like. When the water of the canal reached the Jiang's village, he carried the first bucket of water home. In the following few decades, the canal was extended to 1,500 kilometers long. Ning Hong, CDTN, Linzhou. Well, it is not a big deal today to build this canal, and it wasn't a big deal back then if they had the proper equipment. But just imagine spending 10 precious years working here. The only tool you have is something like a hammering in your hand. Personally, I think uh, here, here one could have a glimpse of what makes the China a prosperous country today. What we see are the skyscrapers, long bridges, and high-speed railways. But behind those material gains lays the spirit of Chinese people. They work extra hours, sacrifice their life, their, their lives and time with family, and for what? Because in the mind of many Chinese who are older than 60, they still have a real memory of the starvation and outer poverty. And no one wishes that they were here building this canal uh, they, because they had to. And so we, so we could enjoy a better life here today. And that's the real testimony of an old Chinese uh, fable. Hmm. Uh, do you go move the mountains? Well, he said, though I can't live forever, but I have my descendants. So long as the generation and the face passes on and mountains doesn't move, why can't we do it? Back to you. Hmm. Very touching story and also explains how China got to where it is today. But for more analysis, we're now joined by Professor Liu Baocheng, Dean of the Center for International Business Ethics at the University of International Business and Economics, and Alberto Lebron, PhD researcher of international political economy at Peking University. Welcome, gentlemen. Uh, Professor Liu, let me start with, um, with you. What do you think of the role that the hardworking spirit of Chinese people play in terms of uh, bringing the country to where it is today? Well, for several thousand years, why China remained the most populous nation? And yes, there is a blessing of the Yangtze River, mm -hmm. Yellow River, and mostly it's really the hardworking people that is really to support mm -hmm. uh, this nation to grow. We lived through hard times, we had happy times, but this hard, uh, hard working spirit is really uh, hammered into the DNA of generations of the Chinese mm -hmm. people. And look at, you know, the uh, f uh, four, uh, 40 years ago uh, when Anhui, uh, uh, a small village in Anhui province was there to beg for food. But once they were given the freedom to grow their own potato, to uh, cultivate their own land, uh, given the household responsibility system, and that really prospered. Mm -hmm. So right now we should really thank, uh, number one, the uh, natural endowment, mm. and number two is the institutional reform the Communist Party has really conducted, mm. and most importantly, it is really the uh, tenacious, the uh, resilience, mm. and hardworking spirit that Chinese people can roll up their leaves mm. and work and pave the road for their children and pave the road to the future. Right, absolutely. So the institutional reform um, came from top to bottom, but it's really the ordinary people who ex ex executed the, the policies. You and me also. Yes. <laughs> and Alberto and I were on the outside looking in. This is my first view of uh, this wonderful area. And while the beauty is just awe-inspiring, it is jaw-dropping to think about the fact that people in this village literally move mountains to carve out roads and get people uh, in here. Uh, what do you think about the hardworking spirit of the people of China? And are you taken aback by what they've been able to do amid this magnificence? 
Well, Sean, first of all, we need to remind that uh, China has laid the foundation of its impressive economic development on people and workers. In 1949, Chinese mm. GDP was lower than many African countries. Now China is on its way to be a global superpower, and this is due to the people. People has been working very hard since 1949. Uh, labor has been the main driving force for economic growth in China. And after 1979, the industrial reform, China has also set up a huge manufacturing industry, which accounts for more than 30% of GDP and that's all people, that's all workers uh, working hard for their families, working hard for a brighter future, working hard for sending uh, their children to study abroad and giving them a brighter future. And today all those children, they are also working very hard, but in the high level, in technology, in services, striving for becoming mm. uh, world class professionals and workers. Mm. Thank you, gentlemen. Well, wonderful. We have had a chance to show you all the diversity that China really has to offer with our crews in the uh, northeast section of the country, in the southeast mm -hmm. section of the country, here and here in the southwest. And now we're going to turn to our southwest, southeast colleagues, rather, <laughs> our colleagues there, uh, Lindy and Cheng Shi. What do you have for us right now? Hi there, Sean and Taoyuan. Now we are coming to you live near the stadium for the 2022 Asian Games in Hangzhou. Now if the success of e-commerce is not evident enough of Zhejiang's uh, striving spirit, then look to the swimming pool. This province's swimming team is producing a league of world-class athletes. Now some of the most decorated swimmers in Chinese history come from right here in Hangzhou. Now, in 2012, 27-year-old Shen Yang became the first Chinese man to win an Olympic gold medal in swimming and is the first male swimmer in history to earn Olympic and World Championship gold medals at every freestyle uh, distance from 200 meters to uh, 1500 meters. Well, that is absolutely incredible. In fact, fellow Hangzhou locals, though, are expected to keep those medals rolling in at the Tokyo 2020 Olympic Games. Zhejiang province and indeed China have pinned their hopes on the likes of Yoshi Wen, who stormed to gold in world record time at the London Games, and bronze medalist Fu Yuanhui, whose lovable nature made her a Rio 2016 fan favorite. But what is it about Shijiang that produces these winning swimmers? Let's bring in our guests for more. We're joined on the bus by Andy Mock, a senior fellow at the Center for China and Globalization, as well as Tim Clancy, Hangzhou's culture and tourism promotion ambassador. Tim, let me start with you. What is Shijiang province's secret? How come they keep producing these amazing swimmers? Well, effectively, China is a population, is a country with a large population. Large populations will inherently have a probability of pooling more talent together. I think it's the systems they have in place for identifying talent earlier and actively uh, nurturing this talent to produce better swimmers. Not to mention that Zhejiang in the south of China is uh, there are many rivers yeah. and streams and places. It's very rich in water resources so it's not uh, it's not a surprise that there yeah. are many good swimmers from this part of China. Yeah, the landscape lends itself to right. so that. It's right. right. amazing. Mr. Mark, here's a question for you. China won its first Olympic gold medal in 1984 on the shooting range, but now it's very different, right? It, China is dominating many fields in the Olympic Games. So how, how important is it, is it for China to, uh, to do so well in the Olympics? Well, I think as a nation, every country cares about national glory, national honor. And China as one of the largest, well, the largest in terms of population and one of the most important countries in the world economically, I think also wants to shine in this area as well. So I think uh, the country, the government, and its citizens, the people of China, care a lot about this. And I want to add a little bit to what Tim was saying, is that, you know, why has China done so well these uh, in the Olympics. Um, so one, 1 1.3 billion people. When we look at every sport requires a certain body type. So we look at swimming. So someone like a Michael Phelps has a 
more than a 6.5 foot arm span. And that's, you know, huge. So just like in basketball, coaches say you can't coach tall, meaning if you're born very short, it's very, very difficult to become a good basketball player. Of course, height is necessary, so, yeah, but it's not sufficient. Content, yeah. So the range of body types we have in China, just because of so many people, there's a joke that if you're one in a million in China, meaning you're so special, you're six standard deviations away from the mean, there's 1,300 other people just like you. <laughs> so there's such a depth of talent to pull from. But also, as we see, China has opened up so much to the world and is bringing in expertise from everywhere. And this, I think, has been another contributor. So it's the raw talent, it's the increasingly world-class coaching. And of course, as we see, the mechanisms are changing too. We're in a transition period from more of a top-down approach to a hybrid approach, including state support as well as more market mechanisms as well as we saw on September 2nd when the state council released its outline for building a leading sports nation. Mm -hmm. Great analysis as always. Thank you to you both. Now, uh, this evening we'll be going uh, on live at uh, the iconic historical Hefang Street in yeah. Hangzhou. We don't know what to expect yet, it's but we'll surely fun, make it fun, right? Exactly. Well, now it's back to you, uh, Sean and Taoyuan. Okay, Chensi and Lindy, we are looking forward to that later on this evening. Well, now we're going to turn to our northeast route. Our colleagues Jonathan and Sinchen, please tell us what you have for us tonight. <laughs> no problem. Yeah, and thank you, Sean and Taoyuan. So we're here in Shenyang, the capital city of Liaoning mm -hmm. province, for the second day, and we are at a very special place, the Shenyang Acrobatic Troop. Yeah, established almost 70 years ago, almost the same age as the, 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 the People's Republic of China. 1951 it was established. It's a big name here, a big brand. Everyone in China knows about it. You probably have seen some of the performances because they travel all over the world. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. To be one of these acrobats, I spent some time earlier today with this group. It takes a lot of time, mm -hmm. a lot Hours. of dedication, and there are children, yeah. about 30 some odd children that are part of the troop here. Mm -hmm. They start training when they are six, years oh, old young. and their entire life is basically here, here yeah recruited from all over china mm -hmm. mainly in the northern parts but they come here they live here they breathe here they eat here and they train here to become an acrobatic performer and mm -hmm. perform for china it's so, like eight hours every day it's eight hours at least every day so let's bring in our guest here as always professor tong jiu mong traveling with us our current affairs commentator so when you look at the dedication that is required to become an acrobatic performer for this troop in Shenyang. I mean, what are your thoughts about that? Why so demanding and why so much dedication? Well, my heart goes to all these kids because it's so <laughs> harsh condition, the harsh training wow. uh, for these young kids. But once again, I think they want to be successful and uh, to be successful, you need to go through all those harsh trainings and also this kind of a separation from your families and uh, you have to be basically isolated I mean, from the rest of the world. And uh, this is supposed to be the very condition that you want to be kind of a, a um, professional or accomplished acrobatic performer. Hmm. But what about like in other areas? Like because Chinese workers are sometimes considered really the most hardworking people here, right? So what yeah, about yeah. Like, like in South Northeast China? What about other industries? Well, I think that this acrobatic tube and the members of this tube actually represents that very epitome of this very Chinese characteristic or Chinese spirit. Uh, broadly speaking, I think there are many drivers behind the, the success of China's success story, mm. especially the economic success story, but plus the kind of a human achievement. These people, these students are actually, uh, to me, are mm. the creator of this very Chinese uh, miracle economically, yeah. socially, and culturally. In this sense, I think that these kids are, first thing first, they're very hardworking, they're very diligent, mm -hmm. they are actually very committed. Think about yeah. the young kids like that, right? I mean, separated from their parents and mm -hmm. receiving this sort of uh, hard training. Uh, and, and, and also, I think they need, uh, uh, we need to call attention to that um, this is also a traditional Confucian style of of dedication, mm -hmm. loyalty, and to a large extent, I think it is also personal sacrifice. Uh, this, yeah. is, this is extremely something that I can 
um, uh, I would like to applaud them. It, it takes uh, absolutely a big round of applause. Yeah, I, I saw it firsthand. We're going to show a little bit later on tonight mm. during China 24 oh, well, yeah. at 2015 Beijing time. We're going to be inside showing you some of these performances because it is truly spectacular. Mm -hmm. It does take a lot of work, a lot of dedication, and a lot of sacrifice. Yeah, and I guess that's all we have, right? And back to you, Shine Telegram. Well, Xinchen, Jonathan, thank you for that, and we're looking forward to your show tonight. But just once again, from where Sean and I are standing, the view right here is absolutely amazing. Um, I think uh, for generations, these mountains and valleys really hindered growth here in this region, but I'm sure um, going in the future, I think of the resilience and the hardworking spirit and the ingenuity of the local people, they're going to find a way to develop this area because this scenery just deserves to be seen by more people. Yeah, indeed it does. And Michael, we're going to throw it back to you. Day 10 on our new China adventure but bittersweet moment for me my better half Tao Yuan is going to call it a trip we're going to pick up a new reporter tomorrow you'll find out then thanks a lot Michael mm, okay some very inspiring stories of that can-do attitude of the Chinese people many thanks for that Sean Caleb's Italian for us in Wuxi as well as my colleagues Lindy Montagana, Yang Chengxi in Hangzhou for us as well as Jonathan Betts and Xu Xinchen in Shenyang. Tomorrow we will take you to China's Hubei province to take a look at some of the country's landmark hydropower projects, so do tune in for that. But for now, let's indeed get to Asian equities. Bit of a mixed picture for this Wednesday. Joel Flynn is in Hong Kong for us with a roundup on that. Joel, break it down for us.